Okay. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the MATC seminar series. Uh, the Mid America Transportation Center is the Region 7 University Transportation Center funded by the US DOT, and their support is greatly appreciated. Uh, not only do they sponsor the, uh, the seminar that we're giving today, they're also the sponsor of the research that we're going to hear about. Um, the presenters are Dr. Al Ratner. Uh, he has his Bachelor in Science from uh, Caltech and a PhD from, uh, from Michigan. And he's joined by Sazad Parveg, his um, PhD student who's working in, in, uh, in mechanical engineering. And with that, we're, we welcome uh, Al to start and we look forward to this talk. Thank you. Thanks, Larry, appreciate it. Uh, I'm excited to have uh, everybody on. And uh, for those of you who, that watch this later on in video, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it and uh, learn some new things and things about uh, what we're doing for research to improve fire safety. So the plan is, is that I'll go through part of the talk, uh, a little more of uh, some of our previous work and how, how the work's progressed uh, to this point. And then uh, Sazad will take over and talk about some of the current work, what he's been doing, uh, the progress we're making, and then uh, I'll wrap it up at the, in the end. We'll take some questions and hopefully uh, uh, people have some, uh, some good questions. So, but if you have questions in the meantime, obviously, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, I'll try to catch them and uh, respond to them. Um, uh, but otherwise, we're happy to answer questions in the end as well. So whatever uh, works for you. So the current project, right? Reducing flammability for Bakken crude oil for train transport. Um, this partly grew out of uh, the previous project was uh, looking at fire safety for liquid fuels, right? Sort of a broader topic. Uh, the first thing that we should do is obviously thank all of the people that have worked on it, right? This is, uh, you know, I just sort of uh, sit on top and help things along, but it's mainly the students that obviously do the work, and we have some collaborators that have assisted as well. Several PhD students uh, that have worked through and contributed to this work, and various master's students, as you can see, and undergraduates that have all done a good job, uh, you know, everything from collecting data and analyzing data to really making good progress. Um, and we have like, some collaborators in Brazil and a collaborator now at Marshall University as well. So the general talk outline, uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, the motivation and the background for this work, what's going on, why, why do we get into it. Um, what we started with with the first uh, five-year Mackey project we had uh, and how we looked at how to make fuel safer, uh, how to address various things. Um, uh, and that was mainly driven, you can see polymer addition, nanoparticles. How do we put something in the fuel to reduce the flammability, right? to make it not burn uh, or make the fires go out quicker? Uh, the other aspect of any fire is I have uh, this part that actually starts the fire, right? the ignition. So I have droplet splashing, which generally creates small little uh, droplets and vapors that actually ignite. So how do we control and understand that aspect? So we actually hey, looked at yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. We got a, a, a note um, that people can't see the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true because I can see it fine. So I just wanted to interrupt just for a second. Are others having trouble seeing the PowerPoint? That looks like everyone can. So I think it was just one. So, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to make sure that the, the thing was going. I, these things happen with these sort of Zoom meetings. So sorry to interrupt. I'll let you continue on. Okay, yeah, like I said, hopefully, uh, I'm assuming everybody can see the slide uh, that I'm basically going over. Um, so yeah, so if anybody has, has problems, obviously, text me or Jan or whatever, and, uh, and uh, we get it worked out. Um, so, uh, kind of Sorry, finishing off. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. So the, uh, finishing off, we obviously did a lot of work in the first project, in the first five-year Mackey project, looking at droplets and droplet splashing and making some improvements. What motivated the current Mackey project was actually a, a similar but different problem, uh, and that was crude oil, right? You had a big change in how much crude oil was being moved, and it became a big fire risk, right? And uh, that's what really drove a lot of our current work. And I'll talk about uh, kind of both parts uh, to a degree, but that's why... Uh, uh, we kind of pivoted a little bit because it became just a much bigger issue. So in general, right, where, why is this an issue? 
uh, well, you can break down U.S. energy use, right? You can see petroleum is a huge chunk of energy use, right? Nuclear, obviously, still chugging along coal. Renewables is growing, and natural gas has been growing, right? And it's expected that probably coal will eventually disappear with natural gas and renewables taking over. But petroleum is a different subject because all of your liquid fuels are heavily petroleum derived, right? There's obviously biodiesel, um, but it's still going to take a while before liquid fuels for transportation go away. And in the meantime, we want to make them safe, right? And the crude oil from which they come, obviously you want to transport it safely. So that's, that's the driving factors. So how do we address that aspect of uh, energy and, and uh, fuel use? Right. Energy resources, obviously there's a lot of natural gas, but you can see the next on the list, 25% is crude oil. So there's a lot of crude oil that you have to deal with, right? And what used to be the case, right? It used to be all down in Texas and, uh, you know, there were smaller deposits around, but that's where, and the, uh, the Gulf, obviously. But what you see in recent years is this big explosion in North Dakota. Right. And as North Dakota extraction has really ballooned, right, this is primarily transported by train. Right. And that's why it became such a big deal was that you got train loads mile, two miles long. And what you started having, as you can see, you know, by 2015, we're reaching pretty high levels. 2014, 2015, 2016, you have a series of accidents, right? And some are just, uh, let's say, bad in the sense that they cause some environmental damage, and some are bad in the sense that they cause a lot of loss of life. There's an accident in Canada, nearly 40 people are killed, right? So it becomes a big issue because the real fear is if you have a major accident in a major metropolitan area, uh, the impact will be will, will be huge, right? and everybody understands it. And so there's a real fear. And so the question becomes, well, how do we address this? Right? And the, the sort of first response that some of you might say is, well, didn't they build the pipeline? Right? A very controversial pipeline, but wasn't there a pipeline to address some of this? In fact, that pipeline at current levels of extraction only can carry 25% of what's extracted in North Dakota. So even with the pipeline, you, the oil trains still continue, right? So we still uh, need to make them safe, need to make this a, a working viable system. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So uh, our phase one, right, the first five-year project we had focused on gas, on diesel, particularly. Uh, gasoline is harder to make fire safe, uh, kerosene, um, I worked with previously, but diesel was kind of the central central focus to make trucks and trains around diesel safer. Um, and we spent a lot of time doing that uh, in different parts. Phase two, right, like I said, we're focusing on crude oil, right? And again, this is driven by shipping from the Bakken region. Uh, it's being shipped primarily to like Virginia on the East Coast. Some of it gets shipped down to Texas, but most of it goes to Virginia. Um, train derailments, large oil spills, um, you know, and so you're trying to suppress splashing, delay ignition, promote flame extinction to make it safer. <coughs> All right, you can see in 20, February 2015, crude oil shipped by rail counter for half of East Coast refinery supply, and that's gone much higher since then. Um, Right, train shipments increased, obviously. Right, and it just keeps going. Right, the problem is, is Bakken oil uh, is, again is a light, sweet variety. There's a lot of very light components, which means that it's easy to get them to ignite. All right, so it's a big issue. Um, in Texas, and I'll sh we'll show you some data. Uh, in Texas crude, there's some light components. But what they do is they actually split them off at the extraction point. So where they pump it out of the ground, they actually split it. Some places they actually put it into natural gas. Other places they just flare it. But the oil that they then put into either typically pipelines, 
doesn't have those light components. So it's much safer, right? In the Bakken, they are not splitting it, right? And that's what makes it more dangerous that if it derails, those light components can easily ignite, right? And so that's, that's a big part of it. Right, or US rail infrastructure obviously has been aging. It does, hasn't been maintained the way uh, experts say it should be, right? Um, you know, when we look at various other things, uh, like I said, fires contribute to deaths. So anytime you have a fire uh, in the transportation system, uh, it's likely to have a much bigger impact than any accident without a fire. So what are we trying to do? Add various additives, polymers, nanoparticles, to reduce the fire hazard. So two main sort of focuses in the sense of the research we do, droplet combustion, and droplets spreading slash splashing, right? Those are the key pieces, right? So can we understand how the droplets burn and hopefully make them burn less and understand how the how droplets splash so that we don't make a whole bunch of little particles that are easier to ignite, right? So for some of the work in the, in the previous Mackey project that we had, uh, this was looking at the splashing, obviously, All right? So you can see two different pictures um, in this case, uh, jet fuel with uh, uh, droplet spreading versus polymer modified jet fuel. And you can see the regular jet fuel produces a whole bunch of fine particles versus the polymer added fuel produces these stringers of liquid, right? They're bigger drops and they're connected, right? That means they don't go as far and they tend to come back down um, and get back onto the surface, right? So they're not floating in the air, which makes them easier to ignite, right? And so this is the one of the ways to try to reduce splashing and try to reduce those small small drops, right? So we broke down the process. <coughs> Excuse me, a couple of different ways. So if I take a drop that's burning, right? How does that drop? Uh, contribute. What you see is, is that I have the drop is burning, it's decreasing in size and diameter. And then if I have uh, different fuels or I have polymers inside the drop, at some point, right, the drop starts to change shape and do crazy things, right? If I have different fuels, this can cause micro explosions, which uh, happens particularly in like Texas crude. If you don't separate it, you'll get micro explosions. Um, but we can try to use some of these effects to our advantage by keeping the drops, uh, even if they start to break apart, from actually spraying small droplets that further ignite the fire. <coughs> so this is a comparison of jet fuel, which is basically kerosene, and diesel fuel. And what you see is that even though they're both refined fuels, right, they both come from crude oil, they behave differently with uh, polymer addition, right? Jet fuel, the burning rates don't change, right? They're still basically parallel. Versus diesel fuel, then in fact, the rate of burning changes. And so we spent a lot of time trying to understand why the rates change for one fuel and not for the other. How is it a due to the mixture of components, some heavy, some light, that contribute to these sort of effects. All right? And we tried pure fuels. You can see N-decane, hexadecane, dodecane, right? They all don't change. So it's clearly a mixture that causes some of the unusual effects that we see, all right? So one of the other things we looked at was how much is it absorption of heat from the flame that then causes some of the things we see? Right. So you can look at nanofluids, nanoparticles, right? They absorb a lot of heat the same way the polymers do, right? But they obviously have different behavior and different properties. So we looked at three different types of nanoparticles, right? Buggy balls. All right, so the what's considered nano-activated carbon, which is the ball type. Multi-wall nanotubes, 
which that's pretty obvious, the tubes. And you can see it kind of looks like spaghetti, right? And then nanographene plates, right, which look sort of like flat sheets, right, which you can see uh, on, the, on the right, right? So very different looking material, right? Uh, made of the same thing, which is carbon. And we can see how this stuff affects the behavior that we see in the fuel. All right, so looking at the particles in jet fuel and diesel, right? No, I mean, we get a little bit of shift in, uh, in the timing, but the rate of burning doesn't, doesn't really change. All the, the rates look the same, right? The lines are all parallel. All right, if we look at the burning time with concentration, well, the more I put in, what happens? Well, if I take the balls, the more I put in, right? The burn slower and slower, and the, you know, kind of flattens out. The plates, I put a bunch in, it burns slower and slower. Right, but it kind of has this initial drop and then changes slowly after that. The walls, I get really weird, it drops and then it comes back up. So clearly there's a couple of different things happening, right? Not just one thing, but a couple of different types of physics going on, All right? And here you can see the process, right? Burning, drop swelling and different things happening, flame dies and then the leftover material burning, the solid material burning at the end. Right. And so depending on the char you get, right, it affects the timing and the, the burning rate you see because you have to burn out those solid pieces that get left. Right. So we looked at, you know, are they aggregating, right? Is this a problem of aggregation? Right, what's really causing the issues that we're seeing? <coughs> well, we can look at what's left over, right? When things get uh, burned, what's left over on our little wires that hold our droplet in the air. And there's the CNP, there's the multi wall tubes, right? And there's the plates. Well, the plates are, it looks like they haven't gone anywhere, right? They're still there. The balls, you see some of them here. The tubes, though, you don't really see. It looks like some weird mess, right? So the tubes have really been transformed a lot more. Right. Uh, buggy balls, you know, you can see them coating the silicon carbide wire, right? But they still look like little balls. They're still pretty much unchanged. All right, multi-wall, if we really zoom in, you know, the plates, again, you can see some of the structure here. You can see a little bit of it, but mostly it's just the buckyballs that, that really remain unchanged. <coughs> so for the burning, you know, we kind of went through a bunch of stuff. We figured out, okay, this is how things burn. This is how the D squared law works. Um, polymers can help things burn a little slower, right? So that helps. That makes it safer. Um, some of the uh, nanoparticles can also modify how things burn. That makes it a bit safer. So we have some tools in our toolkit that we can use for fire safety, right? Um, and, it, and again, these are at small quantities, 1%, 2%, so quite quite limited. It's not like you need to have very high percentages to get the improved safety effects. All right. Um, the bucky balls and the particles, yeah, a little bit worrisome because you're getting some uh, coking and some stuff left over. So for engines, this is a big deal. So you have to be a little careful uh, to make sure that you really burn them out, that they're not going to be left over in the engine. Um, so it's a little bit of a trade-off. Although it does make the fuel, depending how you set it up, under engine conditions, you can make the fuel actually burn faster, right? which can be useful. So it's a, it's a trade-off. 
so on the spreading side, right? There was a previous work on spreading that several of my students had done and people had done over the years. And you break down the spreading into several uh, phases, as you can see, kinematic, spreading, relaxation, uh, then equilibrium phase. And it basically just describes this drop hitting a flat plate. You can see it hits, right? It spreads out. And then does it bounce back or does it just sit there? All right, and so people look at uh, models to try to describe this because what you're really trying to do with the droplet spreading is you want to understand the physics well enough to model it so you can put it into a computer model. All right, people have computer models for sprays, for droplets flying around with fuel, for droplets uh, hitting walls and so on. Uh, but the key is, is that the models that predict how they'll hit and splash right, have pretty large errors. And so the idea here was, well, if we can improve that, we can improve the error, and that means you could then actually model an accident correctly, right? You could have a fuel tank break open, fuel go flying, it hit a surface, splash, the splash flies everywhere, and you actually can correctly compute it, so you can then figure out is it going to ignite or what else is going to happen. So we worked on this again. This is part of the first project uh, under the Matkey Center, right? And so the goal was for this part was to improve the correlations and the models because the existing models had problems. Uh, and there's a lot of prior work with water and glycerin, but almost no work with fuels. So we set up an experiment, diesel, methanol, glycerin, um, right? And we tried to look through how the fuel, how the behavior worked for hydrocarbons, right? And we got various experimental data Right, for this, looking at the different phases of splashing. Right? You can see phase one, phase two, phase three in these things. Right? And you can adjust the data and things collapse pretty well. Right? Diesel, methanol, glycerin, they all look pretty, pretty similar. Right? Their experiments are pretty predictive for what's happening. And so then the goal is, can you non-dimensionalize it so that you have parameters you can use a computer model, right? And so the kinetic phase, you can put in and it matches a power law nicely, right? So if I want to simulate this computer, this will work great. You put in the power law, it doesn't matter what the liquid is, right? It gets matched really well. But you get out of the second graph, the spreading phase, and here I have problems, right? Because the behavior is different. All right, I can get a much bigger spread. All right. Now, when you try to look at this, um, the way people have typically looked at it with Weber number and Reynolds number, it's all over the place. All right. And that, that doesn't help you. That's not predictive. So my student at this point did uh, an Onazord number analysis to try to create a fit with Onazord number to predict what's happening for any of the different uh, cases. And you actually get uh, a good solution. And I'll show you the results. <coughs> and so uh, also comparing with some computer modeling as well. So uh, we have both the original data. So in this case, our data, Sakalo's data, you'll see, and then computer modeling of uh, Sakalo's data, right? Now what you find is, is that this mix, this SCA, DCA model is actually quite accurate for all this stuff. And then if we compare, uh, you know, the actual data, right? The black is the experiments and these things and various other things people have tried you can see the blue line, the green line, they all go off, right? They all don't fit correctly versus the red line, which is the model we came up with actually matches really well. Right. And so even in glycerin, this model actually is much more accurate, right? Now there's a little bit of deviation at higher velocities, but uh, still much better than anything else that existed. Right. And you can see the errors were all quite quite small and a lot better than anything that, that was out there. So we felt like this was a real good, real good contribution 
that we could better predict splashing uh, for <coughs> a range of liquids. And that would let us model accidents uh, for anything, right? Trucks, trains, diesel, um, crude oil. So this was an important uh, benefit from this work. I think this next portion is going to get into uh, the crude oil in the current work. So, uh, Sazad, do you want to take over and uh, talk through it? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, I can stop sharing. You can share your screen. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, I'm Sajid Parvez. I'm currently working as a research assistant and Professor Ratner's lab. So in this part of our presentation, we'll be showing our research approach and methodology and some of our key findings from our current study. So our research approach is based on uh, the, uh, the imaging. So as crude oil is not optically clear, so, and it's composed of thousands of chemical species, uh, it is predetermined to uh, first find a surrogate blend so that we can mimic the splashing and combustion properties of the crude oil. So this, uh, this uh, table shows us uh, the different uh, components of a crude oil from backhand and uh, uh, West Texas immediate and light Louisiana sweet. And this um, table shows us the different properties for uh, mimicking the splashing behavior for the crude oil. So this is our uh, the experimental setup for our droplet combustion uh, experiments. So we, we are actually following the suspended droplet technique, where a single submillimeter sized droplet is suspended on a fine a silicon carbon uh, carbide fiber. We are using a uh, hot well loops for the ignition purpose. So these are our, these are the hot well loops. This is our, our droplet. So solenoid uh, were used for retracting the hot well. So uh, two camera, one uh, high-speed CCD camera and one CMOS uh, car movie camera were used for capturing the total process. And by the image analysis of the capturing the images, we can uh, gather different data relating to the combustion process. So this, is, uh, this slide shows the steps for uh, processing the images. And uh, as you can see that, uh, this is a single droplet, and by doing the linear uh, contrast enhancement or arithmetic and by different operation, we can do the morphological correction and we can get the real values. So in this part, we'll uh, discuss our research outcomes from year one, two, and three of the projects. So uh, our initial focus uh, is on whether we can actually make the stable suspension uh, of nanomaterial. And to study that, we first uh, prepare uh, uh, the settling analysis experiment. So this is a non-contact, non-invasive, and low-cost experimental setup. Uh, as uh, nanometers actually change the opacity of the uh, base fill, which is transparent. So the photosensors can be used to note this change, which will uh, show us the, how, uh, with the time, how much there is a fraction of nanomaterial that is suspended in the, uh, the colloidal suspension. So this is the basic principle of our uh, settling analysis experiments. So the key findings we have found that a uh, new method to characterize the nanofoil stability uh, nanofuel from the hydrocarbon-based liquid fuels and uh, metal and carbon nanoparticle exhibits a metastable states during their settling period. Uh, total settling time is dependent uh, on the initial particle loading and the height of the liquid column. So uh, this is a cheaper sol uh, this is a cheaper settling analysis solution to find out the stability of nanofuel over time and with different mass concentration. So these are some two uh, uh, results from our experiments. So the first one is here, we can, the, in the x-direction we can see the time, and in the y-direction you can see the uh, suspended fraction reading. So this is for the uh, copper oxide nanomaterial with as uh, petrodiesel. So this is a 0.5% nanofill. And as you can see that there is a metastable state. So what we have found that from the settling analysis experiment, there is actually three uh, region or uh, three stages during the settling period. So first one is the settling delay region. Then uh, the, the nanofoil is in the uh, settling 
period. And the last region is the settled out region. So this graph is for the uh, one person uh, acetylene black in renewable jet fuel. As you can see that this is the settling dealer region. This is a nanofuel in the settling region, and this is for the settled out stage. So after, fi after finding that uh, the, nano the nanomaterial can uh, make stable suspension with uh, fuel, so, so in the next step of, so in our next uh, stage of the study, we move to investigate the effect of cheap nanomaterial on simple hydrocarbon fuel. So we have used petrodiesel as a multi-component uh, surrogate fuel for crude oil, and we have used biodiesel as a single component surrogate fuels for uh, crude oil. And we have used acetylene black as nano additive. So uh, what are the key findings for our drop and combustion experiment with petrodiesel and biodiesel with acetylene black? So adding acetylene black up to 1% uh, suppressed the micro explosions in the petrodiesel and biodiesel. Uh, acetylene black addition has no significant effect on, uh, uh, on a petrodiesel combustion rate, but has a significant effect on biodiesel combustion rate. Uh, ignition delay increases and total uh, combustion time decreases with uh, acetylene black addition for both petrodiesel and biodiesel. Uh, the temperature specter uh, shows us that the temperature of the uh, petrodiesel droplet during combustion was higher than the soy-based biodiesel. And the peak temperature of the uh, soybean biodiesel droplet was larger than that of petrodiesel. So these are the some uh, results uh, from uh, based on the ignition delay. And as you can see, with the uh, increasing of the concentration of acetylene black in the soybean and petrodiesel fuel, the ignition delay is, is increasing. And the highest increasing for the soybean uh, biodiesel is observed for three percent loading, and for the petrodiesel it is observed for uh, two percent particle loading. These are the, for, uh, for the total combustion time. Uh, as you can see, with the constant in, uh, increasing the concentration of acetylene black, uh, the total combustion time show, uh, shows a general decrease, uh, decreasing trend, with highest decreasing for 3% particle loading for uh, uh, soy based biodiesel, and for uh, petrodiesel, it is 4% particle loading. So, uh, these are, uh, this is the graph showing the evolution of droplet diameter square uh, for both fuels. And we can see that uh, these graphs uh, for both fuels, they are following, and uh, the nanofuel, they're following the classical disc law of combustion. Uh, these, are the, uh, these are some pictures uh, showing the high speed images of the time evolution of the dropping burning during combustion for biodiesel fuel and petrodiesel fuel. As you can see, that initial diameter for biodiesel was uh, for this particular experiment was 0.84 millimeter, and for petrodiesel it is 0.82 millimeter. And with that, uh, as the droplet combustion continues, uh, the the area of the droplet reduces uh, constantly. And this graph shows the uh, burning rate uh, change with the addition of uh, acetylene black, as I uh, as I discussed in earlier slide that petrodiesel have no significant uh, change in burning light with the addition of acetylene black, but the soy diesel or bio-based diesel has shown a significant change in burning rate and it is actually decreasing. <clears throat> so after uh, generating the droplet combustion rate, uh, droplet combustion data for simple or hydrocarbon, uh, we move to uh, first uh, find out the uh, droplet combustion data for pure U.S. crude oils. And crude oils we have tested are the Pennsylvania crude, the Texas crude, the Colorado crude, and the Beckton crude. So the key findings from our uh, experiment with the U.S. crude oil is that uh, the Beckton, Pennsylvania, and Colorado crude oils burn with four diff different combustion regimes, while the Texas uh, crude oil burn very explosively. Uh, Pennsylvania crude burn uh, the fastest and Bracken crude burn the slowest. Uh, Texas crude was found to have the most instant micro explosion of all crude tested as it is um, it, it, it's one of the most lightest crude well that we have tested. Uh, Texas crude also had the highest ignition delay while Bracken had the uh, lowest. Colorado could have the highest total combustion time, while the back end had the lowest. Uh, back end and Colorado crude left a loose spongy suit uh, residue, while the Pennsylvania crude uh, left behind a more densely packed structure. 
So these are the, uh, uh, the evolution of uh, diameter square with time. Uh, and as you can see that there are uh, four uh, different regimes. So these are for the backhand crude oil and this one on the, on the right ones is for the Colorado crude oil. And as you can see, there are four uh, distinct uh, combustion regimes. So the zone one is the ignition delay zone. Zone two is the steady combustion regimes. Uh, zone three is the bioland microexpression combustion regimes. And as you can see, we, uh, we can see the, uh, the bioland microexpression through the up there is a discontinuity in the peak. And zone four is the steady combustion with low intensity micro explosion. So in all of the crude oil we have tested, we have uh, observed um, a micro explosions. So this is the uh, high speed Im uh, uh, images uh, for the color of the cool crude oil and you can see the distortion and the micro explosions. So these are the micro expression, uh, the 2B and 2C, we can see the micro expression and 1C, we can see a distortions or the uh, effect. Uh, these are for the, uh, these pictures for the micro explosions for the backhand crude well. And as you can see, there is a, uh, there is a micro expression and, sh and then shrunken of the droplet. Uh, the lower uh, left side picture is for the Colorado, uh, is for the, Colored crude oil, and we can see that there is a, a, a bubble formation inside a droplet. This is due to the uh, uh, bubble nucleation growth inside a droplet. And the right side, uh, the bottom right side picture is for the the picture a is for the Texas crude oil, where we're showing that there is a balloon burst micro explosion. And for uh, the picture b, we're showing a uh, splitting type micro explosion. So this is a picture of a typical flame structure of a, a pencil in a crude well. So these are our supporting fiber. These are the droplet and this is our, the flame from. So these uh, images are particularly important for, uh, uh, for investigating the flame from structure uh, on different nanofill. These are the ACM images of the uh, suit sample. So these uh, the right hand side picture is for the color of crude oil. And the left hand side, uh, so one is for the, uh, one is for the uh, backhand crude oil, two is for the pencil bin crude oil, and two is for the colored crude oil. And from the SEM image, we can see that uh, for the backhand and colored crude oil, we are still observing a more sp uh, loose and spongy type suit residue, while for the uh, pencil bin crude oil, there is a, uh, there's kind of a more densely packed suit structure is observed. So after uh, doing the droplet combustion experiment with the uh, uh, US crude wells, then we'd like to, uh, then we move our next step to uh, find out the effect of polymeric additives on the uh, combustion properties of backhand and Pennsylvanian uh, crudes. So the crude oil we have tested is Pennsylvania crude and backhand crude and polymers we have tested is polybutadine with two different chain length of 5,000 and 200,000. So the key findings from uh, this uh, droplet combustion experiments is that uh, the, uh, the PBD 5K decreases combustion rate, while the PBD 200K increases the combustion rate of Pennsylvanian and backhand crude. Uh, there is an increase in ignition delay is observed for PBD 200K with both uh, Pennsylvanian and backhand crude and PBD 5K with backhand crude. Uh, there is a decrease in total combustion time observed for PVD 200K for both Pennsylvanian and backhand crude and PVD 5K with backhand crude. The suit deposit structure revealed that the backhand uh, PVD 5K backhand blends actually leave more density structure than the pure backhand crude oil. Another thing we have observed that uh, during the droplet combustion of pure uh, crude oil, we have seen four uh, combustion regimes, but for uh, the droplet combustion of uh, backhand and pencil with crude the polymeric additives, we have observed five combustion regimes. So there is an additional uh, zone five where we can see that, that poly, uh, where we are defining the polymer combustion regime. So in this region, the, uh, the suit residue of the polymer is actually uh, barred. So we have seen that uh, for both backhand and Pennsylvanian crude oil, we are seeing that there are five uh, distinct combustion regions. So these are uh, some uh, 
high speed images for uh, uh, backend crude with, with uh, PVD 5K. And we are seeing the different uh, combustion region uh, for like uh, in this uh, in the picture B, we're seeing the droplet in zone one, where the beginning, uh, beginning of the combustion of the, the ignition delay. In, and and, and uh, picture C, we are seeing a steady uh, combustion region, which is, which is zone two. And picture uh, D, we are seeing that um, uh, zone three, which uh, corresponds to the violent micro explosion combustion zone. And we're seeing that there is a, a mass ejection uh, due to a micro explosion. And in the zone, uh, in the picture F, we're seeing the droplet in zone five, where the, uh, which is the polymer combustion region. So these are the uh, same images of the uh, uh, soot residue from the back end pentium crudes with, with the uh, polybutadiene uh, polymer. As you can see that uh, the polymeric, uh, these are the polymeric structure and these are the soot structure. And we have observed that the PVD 5K back end bands live behind a more dense black structure compared to pure back end. So after the, our droplet combustion experiments with the polymeric additives, uh, then we move to uh, find out the effect of nanoparticles on the backend crude oils during the droplet combustion experiment. So the crude oil we have tested is backend crude and the carbon-based nanoparticles that we have used is acetylene black and multi-walled nanotubes. So these are the key findings from our uh, experiments that uh, the very low amounts of nanomaterials uh, are required to achieve a significant increase in combustion rates for crude. Uh, average increase in uh, ignition delay is observed for both uh, uh, acetylene black and multi wall nanotubes addition with black and crude. Average increase in total combustion time is observed for both of the nano for uh, for, for for both of the nanomaterial. So uh, acetylene black and multi wall nanotubes is actually increase cause increase in bulk heat conductivity and radiation absorption of back and crude, but with decrease in its vapor pressure. And okay, so this is the uh, uh, graph for uh, pure back and crude, and this one is for the uh, back end with zero five point five or five percent AB, and this one for the two percent AB. Graph B is for the addition of uh, multiple nanotubes of 0.5% and graph D is for the 2% uh, multiple nanotubes. And as you can see, we can see that there is four different uh, combustion regimes uh, are observed for crude oil with nano additives. And this is uh, the zone five is for the char combustion zone or the combustion of the soot residue. So this uh, graph shows the uh, comparison of different uh, of, uh, comparison of, of which standoff ratios for different uh, nanofuel. And as you've observed that the pure uh, crude oil uh, is actually has higher flame standoff ratio than the uh, nanofuel. So these are the uh, uh, this table shows us the summarized results from our uh, droplet combustion experiments. These are the baseball that we have used, that we have used, and these are the uh, nanomaterial and polymer additive data we have used. And these are the effect, uh, whether the effect of the nanomaterial and polymer, whether combustion rate is increasing or decreasing, whether the ignition delay is increasing and decreasing, and whether the total combustion time is increasing and decreasing. And uh, the results of our experiments is actually uh, guide us to uh, select a proper nanomaterial or polymer which can efficiently uh, change the combustion properties that we want to achieve in regards of uh, fuel transportation safety. So these are our year one, two, and three project, uh, uh, some of the key findings from our year one, two, and three projects. So our year four and project goals are consist of the, uh, defining, uh, uh, selecting a splashing surrogate and uh, testing the splashing surrogates, um, testing the fuel droplet uh, splashing experiments, doing a uh, nanofuel droplet splashing experiments, uh, uh, and with uh, uh, data from the splashing experiments and the droplet conversion experiments, uh, we, need, we, we want to actually uh, model a numerical model for splashing behavior simulation and a numerical model for droplet combustion simulation. So, thank you.
Yeah, I wanted to thank everybody for listening. And, uh, you know, you can kind of see how we evolved in our work uh, from really the baseline in diesel and biodiesel through uh, crude oil and the progress we've made. And, uh, yeah, I think we're happy to take questions and uh, uh, both about the details of the work and uh, why we're doing it. So. Great. Thanks, Al. And thanks, Shazad. Uh, Shazad. Um, I didn't see any things in the chat line, but I will open it up to anyone online who wants to. Uh, you can unmute your microphone and ask a question if you wish. Okay, I'll, I'll start some. I'll start it off. Um, uh, it's clear that this is an important topic, and and one of the issue one of the issues we always find is going from the research to the implementation. And I know there are some railway folks online. And I was wondering if you could give an overview of your view of how your research can then, you know, I know we still have a few more years to go and to questions answered, but once that's done, how you, how you could see a potential way to influ, uh, implement the work that you've discussed today. Yeah. Uh, implementation is obviously a, is a big deal. Um, the benefit is that the oil folks that actually do crude oil already use the polymer that we're using uh, uh, for drag reduction in pipelines. So it's currently a polymer that's being put into crude oil uh, to assist in pumping, right? So it reduces drag. So the idea is, is that this is, and the flip side is the refineries know how to take it out, right? So this that's obviously a key piece, right? Anything you put in, the refineries have to take out. And so since they, they've over, they're already doing it, the question is, well, if you go from, let's say, 0.2% or 02 to 3%, where they're currently using it for just drag reduction, if they increase it to 1% or 1.5%, can they buy themselves fire safety as well as drag reduction, right, for, a, for a, let's say, minor cost, right, because the cost even at 1% or 2% is still, you know, I think it's like $0.10 cents or whatever a gallon. It's, pretty, it's, it's still quite small. Um, so that's the idea is, is the, is the path that we're hoping for is to have something that's usable, right? Uh, removable by the refinery, particularly for crude oil, uh, and which buys you some fire safety. Is it going to completely eliminate fire fires, uh, in trains? No, I mean, it's, you know, you have to sort of be reasonable and try to try to have a, a reasonable middle ground, but what it would buy you is for example, a train derailment that maybe causes currently 10 cars to catch on fire. If you have this sort of polymer in it, you might have five cars catch on fire, which so you have a big reduction in the amount of damage, right? The amount of cleanup, all of those things. And if you have a small accident where currently you have one or two cars catching fire, you might be able to pre prevent that altogether. Thanks, Alan. And for everyone listening, I, I, I'm not sure if we covered it. Um, I certainly didn't talk about it at the beginning. It, the issue of rail cars and oil is, is not a small one. And 10 years ago, we had approximately 10,000 rail cars of oil transshipped in the in the United States, most of it through our region. Uh, and about five years after that, we had over 500,000 train uh, tanker cars of crude. So it's a it's an issue for the people in our city. So I wanted to make that clear that. It, it, Clearly, Al's done a lot of great work on, on tanker cars on roadways. He's now gone to tank cars on railways and looking at these different things. And, and clearly, the, uh, the fuel is not going away. So anything we can do to make it safer is, uh, um, is beneficial. And I see we have a, a question for you, Al, in the chat. I'll just read it to you. Uh, what are the differences in composition of the different types of crude oil from the states you analyzed? Uh, and he apologized. He, he's not a chemical engineer. Sorry, sorry if he missed it. So could you kind of quantify the, the differences in the, in the crude that you guys were looking at? So we, we uh, let me answer that kind of a couple of ways. One is we have quantified it. We went over to uh, chemistry to people that obviously do this a lot better than we do. Uh, and they ran full analysis. And so in the published papers that we cited, uh, we actually have the full chemical breakdown of what was in the crude oils. Um, sort of the shorter version of that is it's a little, it's a little funny because what you find is that, um, the mix of sort of light to heavy, um, you know, you think of, uh, Texas crude, obviously might, you know, causes these micro explosions and things go everywhere. Um, 
and partly it's because there's just you know there's kind of a lot of light components and there's a lot of heavy components uh but the mix is such that they don't play well together and so you start heating it up and it micro explodes you look at bakken crude which in fact the other crude oils they don't look that different but they they have much much less micro explosions right so it's it's a it's a little subtle. Like I said, we have in the published papers, we obviously have the detailed full specs and those are fully, you know, you can, you can download and look at them. Um, but it's, it's odd. If you put up, the weird thing is if you put up the spec for diesel, because we did this, so you, you run and you put diesel through the analysis machine and you compare diesel to Bakken crude oil, it's it, not obvious what the difference is. They look pretty similar. Right. And then the question that sort of comes up is, can you just run this stuff in your engine? And the suspicion is with modern injectors, you probably can. You can probably take crude oil, put it in your gas tank in a, in a diesel vehicle and run it. Because it's close enough to diesel with uh, high pressure, you know, common rail injection systems that most people have gone to. They can inject this stuff fine. No problems. So it's a it's a weird world we live in. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, is there any are there any other questions for Al or Sazad? Okay, well, I'm, I'm not hearing any. Obviously, if you do have any follow up questions, uh, we have Al's contact information. I'm sure you'd be happy to answer uh, any questions, any follow up questions that you have. Al Sazad, thank you very much for presenting an excellent presentation. Um, it's a very weird time, as you know, <laughs> usually we'd be in person and we'd be clapping right now. So you can, we'll give you a virtual clap and, uh, thank you everyone for, uh, participating. Uh, if we don't have a chance to talk to, uh, again, before the break, I hope everyone has a safe and ha happy, uh, holiday season. Take care. Yeah. Thanks a lot. We appreciate everybody listening. And, uh, yeah, obviously please, if you have questions, drop us an email, we're, we're happy to send you a copy of the paper or, you know, the, the various papers that we put out with the various information. So, um, you know, uh, but uh, thanks for listening and uh, hope you enjoyed it all. Thank you. Take Thank care. Thank you, everyone, for having us.